to welcome all of you here today as we celebrate the appointment of Professor Ian Baker to the Sherman Fairchild Chair of Engineering Sciences here at the Thayer School. The Fairchild Chair was established in 1980 with a gift from the Sherman Fairchild Foundation to recognize a senior member of the Thayer faculty who has achieved a high level of professional stature and distinction in research, scholarship, and teaching and mentoring of graduate students, as well as the service to the Thayer School. Professor Baker, as many of you know, has an outstanding reputation worldwide in the field of material science. He's a fellow of ASM International, a fellow of the Institute of Materials, Minerals, and Mining, a chartered engineer in the UK, and he is listed in the ISI Citation Index, the Institute for Scientific Information Citation Index, as one of the most highly cited material scientists. Recently, he became the editor-in-chief of the journal Materials Characterization. Professor Baker earned both his BA and Doctor of Philosophy degrees in Metallurgy and Material Sciences at Oxford University. He joined the Thayer School faculty in 1982, so he's had a good, long, and productive tenure here at the Thayer School. He served as Chair of Engineering Sciences and Director of the MS and PhD programs, and he currently serves as the Senior Associate Dean for Academic Affairs. Ian, Thayer School is proud to recognize you as the Fairchild Chair of Engineering Sciences. Congratulations. Thank you all for coming today. Um, in deciding what I was going to talk about, uh, I looked at all the different things I'd done and uh, couldn't really decide, so I decided to talk a little bit about everything. And so that's, uh, that's what I'm going to do today. <coughs> First of all, I'd like to <laughs> acknowledge some of the people who've done this with me. Um, actually, I realized after I'd put this list of uh, actually some of the most important people, and that was the uh, secretarial help I've had here, um, who've been uh, really made life uh, um, uh, wonderful. Uh, before I really get into talk, I thought I'd start out with a, uh, with a question. And uh, it's actually a question that's asked me a lot of times, and it usually goes something like this. Um, you sound like you have a bit of an accent, don't you? Um, <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> where are you from? And um, so, uh, actually, no, that's <laughs> not it. <laughs> So this is actually uh, where I'm from, right in the middle of uh, right in the middle of England, in Derbyshire, which um, which actually has some claim to be in the place where the Industrial Revolution actually started. This is where um, Arkwright had his first water-powered uh, cotton mill, in, and subsequent mills were in the uh, Derwent Valley, going down to Derby. So. So I'm going to talk about a bunch of different things, starting with intermetallic compounds, and uh, I'll turn the lights down since I have a bunch of micrographs here that are a little hard to see in the uh, uh, bright lights, and give you a sort of history of, of, uh, of where I am now. And most of the things I'm talking about are still ongoing stories, so I don't have the answers to, to, to many of these things. So one of the materials I've worked on for a very long time is actually iron aluminum. And one of the reasons for working on this material is it's actually, it's actually the simplest intermetallic compound you can have. There's only two atoms being itself. There's an iron atom at the corner and an aluminum atom in the middle. And I first started working on this compound in 1985 when I was a, a summer fellow at NASA Lewis Research Center. And I've been working on it basically ever since. And if I'm going to talk about materials, I also have to do a little bit of tutorial work here as well. Um, I'm sure most of you take a material science course at some time. But um, uh, in order to explain some of what I'm doing, I wanted to just show this uh, little uh, video of when you deform a material, this is from a website, it's not mine, what happens is you have this plane of atoms move through the structure. So as you shear it, you have this plane of atoms move. And this is a dislocation in the material, and that's how crystalline materials deform. In uh, intermetallic compounds, such as iron aluminum, things are a little bit more complicated. So this is just a, a 2D section here of a, of, of a hypothetical intermetallic compound. 
two types of atoms, an open circle atom and a, and a closed circle atom. And you can see we've got a perfect lattice here. And if you put one of those little dislocations in here with an extra half plane, what that does, it messes up the lattice so that now you have the wrong type of atoms next to each other. So in order to um, not produce this, this continuous plane as the dislocation moves through here of wrong neighbors, you actually have to put another dislocation in there. And it's joined to the original dislocation by what's called an antiphase boundary, which is right here. And we'll see some of those in a bit. And they turn out to be quite important in this, this material. So one of the uh, things I worked on in, in uh, iron aluminum for qu quite a while is this thing called the yield anomaly. Now many materials, when you strain them, um, the, uh, the, their strength actually gets, uh, goes, uh, decreases with increasing temperature. And this material, iron aluminum, actually if you look at the strength as a function of temperature, decreases initially, but then it increases before decreasing again. Okay. And so uh, this is actually referred to as a yield anomaly because it's somewhat unusual behavior. You might uh, think of a normal material like a piece of butter you take from, a, from the fridge. When you take it from the fridge, it, it's hard. If you let it warm up, it gets very soft. And that's typical of many materials. This is a little different. So, so what could be the cause of this behavior? Well, uh, Iso George and I, uh, Iso George at Oak Ridge National Lab, came up with this model where we have these two dislocations represented by lines here, and they have this antiphase boundary between them. If they encounter a vacancy in the material, what that vacancy does is actually put a little step in the material. Okay? And so that the, the first dislocation produces this APB, and the second one now doesn't cancel it out because of the step. So when the dislocation moves, it produces these tubes in the material. And so basically what we did, we modeled the behavior of this material using this idea that we had this vacancy hardening mechanism. So here's some, the, the squares are actual data from tests that a student did, and the, the curves are some modeling that we did. So we could actually fit the curves based on, in this little region here, based on this vacancy hardening mechanism, and then at high temperatures the vacancies are able to move around more easily, they no longer strengthen the material, so the material actually gets soft with increasing temperature. So it could fit the data very well, but uh, just fitting data uh, is not very useful in the model, you need to be able to predict things. So one of the predictions of our model was that as you uh, increase the strain rate, as you pull the material more rapidly, then this, this, uh, these curves here would move off to the right, so this peak would actually move to higher temperature and higher strengths. And if you pulled it much, much more slowly, then this curve here would move down to, to lower temperature and a lower value, and eventually if you pulled it slow enough, the, you wouldn't get the peak at all. So we tested that uh, behavior in a, a couple of different materials, uh, slightly different compositions, and you can see, in fact, that's what happened. If you look at the yield strengths of function of temperature, we have three different rates at which we test the material. At this uh, very slowest rate, the blue curve here, we do not at all. As we go to uh, higher still we get a bigger peak, higher temperature. The same sort of thing happens here in this higher, uh, di slightly different composition of material. This high rate here, you can see, is actually quite a, a rapid rate. This is 2,000 per second, so this is actually being strained very rapidly. So our model worked, and we went on to test that uh, many more different ways. The other interesting thing about iron aluminum, it, it exhibits what's called strain-induced ferromagnetism. And that, this is a property of the material which is, um, um, if you don't understand it, it's almost like magic. Uh, if you, uh, what this is, shows uh, a curve, this is the, a magne the uh, uh, field strength of an applied magnetic field and the magnet magnetization in the material. Okay. So if you have a piece of iron aluminum, what you get is this curve here, you can hardly see it uh, from, different from the horizontal, and this is referred to as paramagnetic behavior. Um, you've probably all seen this in physics, where when you apply a field, the magnetic moments line up when the field's there, when you remove the field, the, the moments start to become uh, uh, randomized and you no longer have any uh, magnetization. What these other two curves here are basically the same material that's either been cold rolled or simply hit with a hammer. And they actually become ferromagnetic in this case, okay?